Suddenly embracing an album like The Downward Spiral at the age of 10 might seem a bit off, but then again, my tastes have always been somewhat dark. A big factor in this was the suicide of Kurt Cobain, which happened a month to the day after the album's release. And having been an enormous fan of the Seattle-based trio, it created a sizable vacuum in my best band ever category. Seven months and one day after an electrician noticed there was something rotten in the state of Lake Washington, Nine Inch Nails came to my hometown on what was known as the Self-Destruct Tour. And somehow, by the grace of God, who is dead and no one cares, I convinced my parents to let me attend the show. It was loud and angry, and even though I had to suffer through the shrill caterwauling of a then-unknown Marilyn Manson, it was one of the best experiences of my life at that point. When Reznor and company played two of the cheerier numbers from the Downward Spiral, those being the title track and the so epic Johnny fucking Cash recorded it as his own musical epitaph hurt, a translucent screen was draped over the band, and various images of grainy black and white death and destruction were projected onto that screen. And while watching time-lapse footage of a fox decomposing in reverse to the tune of a harrowingly depressing song about the merits of a self-inflicted gunshot wound might not be every ten-year-old's cup of tea, I thought it was pretty fucking sweet. That performance was the first thing I thought of when I dove headfirst into Limbo's monochromatic angst. And as I progressed through the game, I was also reminded of an old SNES platformer called Flashback, in which the protagonist wakes up in a jungle with a case of amnesia and the good sense to keep quiet about it. Unlike Flashback, which I never owned and consequently never got very far in, I played the ever-loving shit out of Limbo, even to the point of having the game memorized. Part of the reason I played the game so much is a trophy for making it through the game in a single sitting with five or fewer deaths. And while that may seem almost lenient for gaming achievement standards, it's actually a lot harder than it sounds. Over the course of the game, you'll fall to your death several times. You'll get shot, stabbed, decapitated, drowned, electrocuted, crushed, and even cloven in twain by a circular saw here and there. But I wasn't playing the game that much just to be able to avoid the myriad ways in which the game can kill you. I was also trying to pick apart the game's story, of which there is very little in the conventional sense. There's a famous anecdote about Ernest Hemingway, which has the writer taking on a wager that he could concoct a story with the beginning, middle, and end using ten words or less. To which he responded, For sale. Baby shoes. Never worn. Though the story is likely a fabrication, it's a brilliant example of linguistic economy, regardless of who actually wrote those six words. Without counting the text that appears in the game's menus, Limbo also meets the requirements of that wager, using a total of ten words, nine of which don't appear in the game itself, and the tenth is something of a red herring if you ask me, but that's a debate for an entirely different video altogether. The nine words of note are the game's tagline. Uncertain of his sister's fate, a boy enters Limbo. To many gamers, this carefully worded sentence gives the impression of a damsel in distress scenario, as if the game were some sort of clinically depressed Super Mario Brothers as directed by Fritz Lang. In fact, you're free to interpret the game as such from start to finish, but doing so makes the abrupt ending seem half-assed. And if you think this game's ending is half-assed, frankly I think you're the one who's coming up short. Though some argue that the game's cryptic nature is indicative of laziness on behalf of the game's creators, there's enough symbology in the game to choke a dozen donkeys, and the events of the game have inspired a slew of healthy and mostly civilized debates in the forums regarding the game's meaning. And if that's not art, Roger Ebert, fucked if I know it is. It goes without saying that this game is not for everyone, because really, nothing is for everyone. But if you can stomach the absence of words, color, happy thoughts, artificially lengthened gameplay, and a third dimension, this game is worth every penny of its seemingly steep price. (laughs) 